Hey, thank you for dropping by for my daily devotions, December the 12th, 2023. And um, we are going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Luke 13, Proverbs 11, and Numbers chapter 12. A bunch of great passages. Yesterday we looked at 1 Corinthians, no, we looked at Luke chapter 12 yesterday. And... Um, Luke 12, starting at verse 22. This, you know, we live in tough financial times. Uh, the uh, uh, government has destroyed the economy again. They keep doing that in my lifetime. Now, my lifetime is, a, you know, sliding into 75 years here, but they've messed the government, the, the uh, economy up before. So we have tough times, okay? Tough times. Uh, verse, verse 22 of the 12th chapter. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. Today that's like saying, don't worry about how you're going to pay the bills. I'm going to take care of you, okay? Life is more than food and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. <laughs> Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? You know what? You can worry and take a bunch of hours away, but they'll never add anything to you. It solves exactly nothing, okay? So since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Don't worry. Trust Jesus. Keep going. Trust Jesus and keep going. Let's pray. Father, pray that you would use this day. I pray that you'd speak to our lives by the truth we find in your word. Address us by the scriptures today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And uh, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It's a great chapter. Actually, there's no bad chapters. Do you ever, <laughs> yeah, every day I come in here and say, oh, this is a great chapter. Well, because they're all great. <laughs> <clears throat> now about spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that when you were pagan somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray by mute idols. Therefore, I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, says Jesus be cursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. That's why the Lordship of Christ is such a huge issue, folks. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom. To another, the mes message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues or languages, that word is used interchangeably with language in the Greek language, and to still another the interpretation of tongues. These are the work of one and the same spirit, and he gives them to each one just as he determines. The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ, for we, we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Now the body is not made up of, of one part, but of many. The foot should not, uh, the, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body. It would not for that reason cease to be a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body. It should not for that reason cease to be a part of the body. If the whole body were an e eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts of the, the, that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it 
so that there should be no division in the body, but that all its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you, and each one of you is part of it. And in, in the church, God has appointed first of all apostles, second prophets, thirds teachers, then workers of miracles, also those having gifts of healing, those able to help others, those with gifts of administration, and those speaking in different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all do work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret, but eagerly desire <clears throat> the greater gifts, and I will show you the most excellent way. And then the love chapter starts, which we'll look at tomorrow. P powerful, powerful, powerful. Luke chapter 13. <clears throat> I'm having allergies today. They're driving me crazy, actually. Sorry about that. It makes it more unpleasant for you, and I, I wouldn't wish that on you. Luke chapter 13. Now, there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all perish. That still stands today. Repentance is, means you change the direction of your life. Change your mind and change the direction of your life. Repent. Turn away. You've been going away from God. Turn back and go to him. Change. Change your direction. Or those 18 who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Then he told this parable. Man had a fig tree planted in planted in his vineyard, vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but it but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, "For three years now I've been coming to uh, to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil?" Sir, the man replied, "Leave it alone for one more year, and I'll dig around it and fertilize it." If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, cut it down. In other words, give us he's going to give us all a chance to bear fruit. And it, repentance is a part of what it takes to get there. Okay, so give us some time. On a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues, and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you're set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hand on her, and immediately this, she straightened up and praised God. Indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue ruler said to the people, There are six days for work, so come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. The Lord answered him, You hypocrites, doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 years, long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her. When he said this, all who all his, all his opponents were humiliated, but the people were delighted with all the wonderful things he was doing. Then Jesus asked, What is the kingdom of God like? What shall I compare it to? It's like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his garden. It grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air perched in its branches. Again he said, he asked, what shall I compare the kingdom of God to? It is like yeast that a woman took and fixed in a large amount of flour and mixed in, into a large amount of flour until it worked all through the dough. Then Jesus went through the towns and villages teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? He said to them, make every effort to enter through the narrow door because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, Sir, open the door for us. But he will not he but he will answer, I don't know you. I don't I don't know you or where you can come from. Then you will say, We ate and drank with you, we taught in your streets, but he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from, away from me, all you evildoers. There will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves thrown out, people will come from east and west and north and south and will take their places at the feast of the kingdom of God. Indeed, there are those who are, who are last who will be first and first who will be last. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, Leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. 
He replied, go tell that fox, I will drive out demons and heal people today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will reach my goal. In any case, I must keep I must keep going today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Proverbs chapter 11. Love the book of Proverbs. Wisdom. We need wisdom, don't we? Proverbs chapter 11. We all need wisdom every day. There it is, Proverbs 11. The Lord abhors dishonest scales, but accurate weights are his delight. When pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. The integrity of the upright guides them, but the unfaithful are destroyed by their duplicity. Wealth is worthless in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. The righteousness of the blameless makes a straight way for them, but the wicked are brought down by their own wickedness. The righteousness of the upright delivers them, but the unfaithful are trapped by evil desires. When a wicked man dies, his hope perishes. All he expected from his power comes to nothing. The righteous man is rescued from trouble, and it comes on the wicked instead. With his mouth, the godless destroys his neighbor, but through knowledge, the righteous escape. When the righteous when the righteous prosper, the city rejoices. When the wicked perish, there are shouts of joy. Through the blessing of the upright, a city is exalted, but by the mouth of the wicked, it is destroyed. A man who lacks judgment derides his neighbor, but a man of understanding holds his tongue. A gossip betrays a confidence, but a trustworthy man keeps a secret. Why, that's huge. That's just huge. For lack of guidance, a nation falls, but for many ad advisors make victory sure. He puts who he who puts up security for another will suffer will surely suffer, but whoever refuses to strike hands and pledge is safe. A kind-hearted woman gains respect, but ruthless men gain only wealth. A kind man benefits himself, but a cruel man brings trouble on himself. The wicked man earns deceptive wages, but he who sows righteousness reaps a sure reward. The truly righteous man attains life, but he who pursues evil goes to his death. The Lord detests men of perverse heart, but he delights in those whose ways are blameless. Be sure of this, the wicked will not go unpunished, and those who are righteous will go free. Like a gold ring in a pig's snout is a beautiful woman who shows no discretion. The desire of the righteous ends only in good, but the hope of the wicked only in wrath. One man gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. A generous man will prosper, and he who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. People curse the man who hoards grain, but blessing crowns him who is willing to sell. He who seeks good finds goodwill, but evil comes to him who searches for it. Whoever trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will thrive like a green tree, like gr green leaf. He who brings trouble on his family will inherit only wind, and the fool will be servant to the wise. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. The righteous receive their due on earth, how much more the ungodly and the sinner. And then Numbers chapter 12. Numbers, chapter 12. Miriam and Aaron began to talk. This is a great chapter, great chapter. Began to talk against Moses because of his Cushite wife, for he had married a Cushite. Cushites are Ethiopians. This was a black woman, okay? A black woman. He uh, has the Lord's spoken only through Moses, they asked. Hasn't he also spoken through us? And the Lord said, and, and the Lord heard this. Now Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. Greatest leader maybe in the history of the world, but humble. Think about that. At once the Lord said to Moses, Aaron and Miriam, come out of the tent of meeting, all of you. So the three of them came out and the Lord came down on a pillar of cloud. He stood at the entrance to the tent and summoned Aaron and Miriam. 
When both of them stepped forward, he said, listen to my words. When a prophet of the Lord is among you, I reveal myself to him in visions. I speak to him in dreams. And this is not true of my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him, I speak face to face, clearly and not in riddles. He sees the form of the Lord. Why then are you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Well, he's calling them down, you know. The anger of the Lord burned against them and he left them. The cloud lifted from above the tent. There stood Miriam, le leprous like a snow. Aaron turned to her and saw that she was leprous. And he said to Moses, please, my Lord, do not hold against us the sin we have foolishly committed. Do not let her be like the stillborn infant coming from its mother's womb with its flesh half eaten away. So Moses cried out to the Lord, oh God, please heal her. And the Lord replies to Moses, if her father had spit in her face, would she not have been in disgrace for seven days? Confine her outside the camp for seven days. After that, she can be brought back in. So Marian was, Miriam was confined outside the camp for seven days, and the people did not move on until she was brought back. After that, the people left Haz Hazaroth and encamped in the desert of Paran. Uh, God jumped Moses' brother and sister because they got on him for marrying a black woman, okay? And one of the things you come out with here is that the first lady of Israel was an Ethiopian black woman. God is not a racist, and we are not to be racists. Everybody's the same. We all bleed red blood, okay? And we all have a soul that needs Jesus. Hang on to that. Let's pray. Father, thanks for your, the truth from your word today. Change our lives by what we heard, Father. Make us new because we heard from you. Write a new law on our heart by the power of the Holy Spirit and make us different because we heard from you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.